ahead and turn with me to the book of Zephaniah. We're in chapter 1. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 6. Just as, again, I know, you know, you don't wake up in the morning and say, man, I really want some coffee and I want to go find the minor prophets and I want to read about God's judgment just to get my day started off right. Uh, but I think the danger is there was a man named Marcion who, who did not like he found things in God's word that he didn't like. And so he said, you know, I'm just going to cut that out. I'm going to cut that out. Oh, I, I've read this. I don't really like that. I'm going to cut that out. And all that he was left with was a small portion of one gospel and a few of Paul's letters. Because he found something in every other part of God's word that offended him. And so he just got rid of it. And, and so when we come to God's word with that attitude of not looking at the whole, we... we be, God's word to us becomes an idol, in a sense, and, and so we don't want to do that this morning, but I think in thinking about God's judgment, we, all, we can also have the idea that, you know, every one of us has thought in some time or another, with some reason or another, that, you know, that's never going to happen to me. I used to say, you know, when I get married, when I have kids, I'm never going to gain weight, and sure enough, I gained weight. You probably said, you know, I, that's never going to happen to me, I'm never going to you know, not be able to do these things, or I'm never going to get that disease. You know, how many of you, or how many of you know someone that said, you know, COVID, that's never going to hit me. And then it did. And, and I think we, we have this idea that no matter how strong or weak we may be, that, that we're just invincible. But we're really not. That it all can affect us. And whether it does or not, it's only by the grace of God. And and I think that idea of, well, that's never going to happen to me can carry on into the way that, that we think about God's judgment. You think about Israel and, and throughout the history of the Old Testament, Israel, they, they had that idea that we are God's chosen people. Look at all the things that he's done for us, leading us out of Egypt, bringing us into the promised land. He's never going to kick us out. They thought it would never happen to them. It would never happen here. That's the world Zephaniah was living in. I think we look at the prophets and we say, man, they, they were some unsuccessful preachers because they preached and they preached, but there was no change because they were preaching truth. But truth about God's judgment, truth that the people did not want to hear and they did not believe. I think that's the world Zephaniah was living in. But sadly, I wonder, God, is that not the world that we live in? Where people look at God's word and say, that's not true, that's not relevant anymore, that has no bearing on my life. That's unloving, that's ungracious. And it's truth, but they don't receive it as truth. And if we're not careful, that can seep into our life as well. And so to guard against that in our own hearts, in our own church, we must approach God's word with, with faith, believing every word that he has said. So let's go ahead and read verses 2 through 6. Again, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2. This is what the Lord says. It says, I will completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I will sweep away people and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the residents of Jerusalem. I will cut off every vestige of Baal from this place. The names of the pagan priests along with the priests. Those who bow and worship on the rooftops to the stars in the sky. Those who bow and pledge loyalty to the Lord, but also pledge loyalty to Milcom. Those who turn back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So our passage this morning, it, it's about the coming day of the Lord. Verse 7 tells us that be silent in the presence of the Lord for the day of the Lord is near. It's near and it's rapidly approaching. And so the, the, the beginning judgment declaration, it starts off very broad. It's on a global scale. And then as 
as we move through, we see in verses 4, 5, and 6 that it's more pointed and specific. But the first thing we see is that the day of the Lord is going to be felt in all of creation. That's our first point this morning, that the day of the Lord, it will be felt in all of creation. Just look at what seems to happen. He says, I will completely sweep away everything. I think the key word here is, is a way. It's not sweep, but God is going to do away with. He's going to destroy. He's going to put an end to everything. It could also be to die in an epidemic if, if you thought COVID was terrible. And it was. As we watch the daily death count just go up dramatically. It compares in no way to the day of the Lord, the utter destruction and devastation that God is going to unleash on everything on the face of the earth. Verse 3 says, I will sweep away people and animals, the birds of the sky, and even the fish of the sea. If, if you think back to Genesis, there should be a connection in your mind that, that these sound familiar, but in opposites, this is an act, this is the exact opposite of the created order. On day five, God created the fish of the sea, and then He created the birds of the air. Then on day six, He created the animals that were on the land, and then later on day six, He created mankind in His own image. What God is doing here is the opposite; He is de-creating. His judgment is coming on every aspect of creation and it starts with man you say well goodness we were the last one to be created why are we the first one to be cut off because god gave us his dominion he said i am giving you authority and dominion over the earth to rule over it to subdue it and with great privilege comes great responsibility that we were given the responsibility to fill the earth with the glory of god with the praise of his name and Instead, we fill the earth with our own pride. And so the judgment of God is coming, and it's coming deservedly because we have failed to do really what we were created to do, to exalt our Creator. And then as you think about the, the weightiness and the heaviness of this statement that I will completely or utterly destroy, sweep away everything, maybe your mind goes like some to... The question, well, didn't God promise that he's not going to destroy the world again? Didn't he make that promise to Noah? Look with me in Genesis chapter 6, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. It says, after the flood, he said, when the, when the offerings on the, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. And then in chapter 9, verse 11, God says, I establish my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by the floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. And so kind of what we're left with here, it, on the surface, it can seem like, okay, God, you told Noah one thing, and now you're telling Zephaniah another thing. The promise you made and the revelation you gave don't, don't match up. But I really don't believe there's a contradiction. I think in, in three ways— we see the first one, God promised that he would not destroy the world with what? With the floodwaters. The judgment coming that's promised in Zephaniah and even in Jesus' day and beyond in the epistles is it's not a judgment of water, but it's a judgment of what? It's a fire that Jesus said, how I wish even now that the kindling was already ablaze. That the judgment coming that's promised here, and even in Zephaniah, it's a judgment of fire. But, but also God's told Noah that as long as the earth endures, these things, seed time and harvest, day and night, will not cease. But God knew that the earth could.
could not endure forever because of the evil inclination of our heart. He knew that one day it would have to come to an end. But also I think that the biggest reason that these don't contradict is, is because of the promise that God gave of salvation. That just even in the days of Noah, God preserved Noah and his family in the ark. And even in Zephaniah, when we get to chapter 3, we see the promise and the hope that God will save the righteous remnant. That every living thing will not be swept away in destruction because God has promised to preserve, not this time through an ark, but through the cross of Jesus Christ. That, that if you have faith in his son, then the judgment has already been absorbed by Jesus. It does not rest on us. And so I don't see a contradiction here, but just the promise of God's goodness and mercy and grace that, yes, judgment is coming. Yes, it will be severe. It will be felt in all of creation unless... Like Zephaniah, as we saw last week, you are hidden in the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and that also answers the other question of, okay, why in the world does the New Testament talk about a new heaven and, and a new earth? Why do we need that? We see that we need it here in Zephaniah because this world has been completely corrupted by sin and by death. That that God created everything is all good. Everything he created, he says, and this is good. And the Lord said that it was good. But in our sin and in our deception and in our wickedness, we have made everything corrupted. Everything has been tainted with sin and death. And so we need the world to be purified, either to be purified by fire or to be destroyed and start over Afresh. I'm not sure which one it will be, but we know that, that the fire of God is, yes, it's for judgment, but it's also a purifying fire. But the key thing I, I want us to see is, yes, the judgment is real. We don't need to ignore it. We can't ignore it. But that as much as a reality is God is a just God, he is also a loving and a merciful God. Psalm chapter 30 Verse 5 has the beautiful words that for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. That, again, as we saw last week, that yes, God's judgment is his strange work, but he exists. He loves to love us, to pour out his mercy and forgiveness. He is patient and his love and favor, it lasts all eternity. And so, yes, the day of the Lord is going to be felt in every corner of the planet, in every aspect of creation. But the second point this morning that we see in our passage is that the day of the Lord will be felt against all idol worshipers. And, and this is kind of where it becomes more focused. It, it starts off global. Every part of the earth is going to feel it. But it's aimed specifically at the root cause, the root cause of idolatry. Look at verse 4 again. It says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the residents of Jerusalem. I will cut off every vestige of Baal from this place. The names of the pagan priests along with the priests. That of all the planet, it's interesting that that God doesn't start, like he started with global scale. Everything is going to feel the judgment of the Lord. But now he's pinpointing it not to the wickedness and the idolatry of the nations, but he starts, no, with Judah and Jerusalem. If there was one spot on the planet that was supposed to remain pure in their worship of the Lord, it was the tribe of Judah. It was the city of peace, Jerusalem. But God is saying, no, I'm going to start there. I'm going to stretch out my hand against all the residents of Jerusalem. I'm going to cut off every last trace of Baal. And it's interesting. It says, where? From this place. And it starts with us. As easy as it is to point the finger 
at others. God points the finger first right directly into our own hearts. The word for cut off, it, it, it's a word that it means to completely exterminate. You know, Crystal, she hates with a, with a burning passion. She hates cockroaches. She wants to wipe every single cockroach off the face of the earth, and not just to kill them, but she wants them dead and gone. She wants them exterminated. She doesn't care if they're the so-called good kind or not. She wants every single one gone. And that's the kind of hatred that God has here for idolatry, that I am going to exterminate. I am going to cut off every last trace of idol worship and yes, the nations are filled with it, but he starts first with his own people. I will cut off. Baal is a, uh, when we think about Baal in the Old Testament, that was a, to say that it was a persistent God for Israel is an understatement. That from the moment that they stepped into the promised land until they were kicked out, Baal was a problem. In fact, Baal was the main expression of their idolatry that got them kicked out of the promised land. The, the Baal, the word, can be translated as Lord. It can be translated as Master. Or it can be translated as Husband. All three of these things are how the Lord reveals himself to his people. He is our Lord. He should be our Master. He is a loving to us like a loving and perfect Husband. But instead of Israel giving the glory and the praise and the attention to the true king of kings and lord of lords, they gave it to the Canaanite fertility and storm god named Baal. He was the one that you would pray to when you needed rain. He was the one you would pray to when, when you needed a good crop or even when you needed a son or a daughter to be born. He was a practical God that, that turned Israel's heart away from the Lord and, and onto him. But when we think about Baal in our life, we don't, again, we don't fall into the habit of, again, I say this before, but most of you don't go home and bow down to a little wooden statue or a golden statue. But Jason DeRucci, he, he summarized Baal worship really well. He said that, Baal exemplifies all that is hostile to Yahweh. We turn from giving the Lord his due whenever we began to look to something other than him as our ultimate provider, protector, and treasure. So Baal for us, idolatry for us, is when you look to anything to provide, anything to protect you, or anything to give you joy and satisfaction. I mean, how wisely did Jesus say in Matthew 6, 24, that, that no one can serve what? Yeah. Two masters. You can't serve, the Lord can't be your master, and Baal can't be your master. You can only have one. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And so when we think about, yes, Baal was Israel's persistent idol, I think here, and, and, and you all believe it, you see it all the time, that in America, in our culture, we have persistent idols as well. Idols that, no matter how much we fight against them, no matter how much they're preached against, they seem to persist. And I think all, regardless of what we worship, our idolatry we talked about in Sunday school, our struggles can come from different sources. But if we're honest, I think it all traces back to pride. I mean, how many people in our country would, would, would praise the name of Jesus with their lips, but in their heart they have more pride in being an American than they do as a part of God's kingdom? How many people, and, and us, again, it starts with us, the, the pride that the love of money can bring and say, look at what I can do, what I can gain, the joy that this brings, and but the end of 624 that Jesus said, you cannot what? Serve God. Serve God and money. It's one or the other. The pride of self we see all the time, even in our own life, that look at what I can do in my independence and in my self-reliance and in my, in my strength and my power. 
I mean, isn't that really what to turn back from the Lord is? Why in the world would I need to seek the Lord? Why would I need to inquire of the Lord when I have me, myself, and I to consult? It's the definition of turning away from the Lord to being caught up in the pride of self. And then how in the world, as a country, have we gotten to the point that we spend an entire month worshiping and celebrating pride? June, if you Google it, it's called Pride Month. I mean, think about other holidays. Easter, you might get an afternoon meal with your family. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, if you're lucky, an entire day. Christmas, I know we have the holiday season, but even that's, most of that celebration goes back to the pride of the love of money. We want what we need, or we, we celebrate what we can buy, what we can gain. Maybe even Christmas, you only get a day or two to celebrate with your family. But pride, no, we're going to take an entire month and we're going to celebrate the right that we believe we can do whatever we want with whoever we want. We're going to blatantly disregard God's word. In the very first chapters of the Bible, God said, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. That, that there is no such thing as a homosexual marriage. That, that marriage is defined by God as one man and one woman brought together by God forever. Period. But yet in our pride, in our wickedness, we have idolized everything in our culture except the one thing that our worship should be aimed at. And again, it's easy to, to point the finger at Israel and say, well, well goodness, y'all should have known better. After seeing the, 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 sea, the Red Sea split and walk through, how in the world can you bow the knee to Baal? It's easy to point the finger at our culture and say, goodness, how have you got to this point? But again, Zephaniah, he wants us to point the finger first at ourselves and and I think it starts in verse 5. The danger zone for us here in the church is, it says, Those who bow and worship on the rooftops, the stars in the sky. But listen to this next part. Those who bow and pledge loyalty to the Lord, but also pledge loyalty to Milcom. Milcom was the Ammonite god. It could also be translated <laughs> as their king. I think this is where we fall in. We think of idolatry as either, okay, we either worship God or we worship something else. But right here it says, no, you can do both, kind of. You can't really. You can trick yourself into thinking you're worshiping God when, but really, Jesus plus anything equals idolatry. And I used to think that, you know, syncretism, that's the mixing of deities or the mixing of religions that, but I, was, I guess I was naive enough to think, well, that's only problems for missionaries. Because when we were in South America, or when I was in South America, uh, 500, 600 years ago, as the Spaniards came, they, they said, all right, you can worship Jesus or we can kill you. The choice is yours. And they said, all right, I guess we'll worship Jesus now. And so they, but over the years, the pictures of Mary on the churches and the pictures of Jesus on the cross of they may be saying words to Jesus, but they're seeing beyond it to worship their ancestors, to worship the nature of the same things that they did before. They've just kind of covered it up with these images. And so now they're so confused, they don't know what to believe. Or in South Asia, that it really doesn't take much to get a good Hindu to believe in Jesus, to worship Jesus. They've got 300 million other gods. Let's add one more who has power over disease and death. That sounds pretty cool. The hard part is to get them to only worship and only believe in Jesus. But as much as the world has mixed worship, and it's not just South Asia and South America and West Africa, I believe we do it all the time. We praise Jesus with our lips, but... We have another king in our closet that we worship, we gravitate towards if we are not careful. 
Again, Jesus plus anything is idolatry. God says, and you might as well not even worship me. Because if you mix anything with me, you're not. And, and again, that brings us back to the church. If, if we're not careful to guard our worship, if our worship is corrupted, how in the world can we offer hope to a lost and a dying world? In many ways, we've become hypocrites worship, saying that we praise Jesus, but worshiping the same thing the world wor worships right along with them. Again, if we're not careful, we'll point the finger and say, well, goodness, talks about, I don't go up and bow down on my roof to the stars, and I don't even check my horoscope. So-and-so, they live by their horoscope. Shame on them, or... How many people do we think, oh, so-and-so, when COVID hit, they took that as, a, as an excuse to leave the church. I guess they've turned back from following the Lord. But again, it starts in our heart. My prayer for us, my prayer for myself first this week has been God. And again, if you underline in your Bible, I would encourage you to underline in verse 4. As a prayer and say, God, I want you to cut off every last trace of idolatry from within my heart. God, I want you to cut off every last trace of idolatry in our church. That, that it's going to be destroyed one way or another. God, just put it to death now. Give me freedom to walk away from it in repentance and in truth. And, and how we get there, I think... Oh, goodness. I didn't write his name down. I didn't come up with this. Uh, Harold somebody. Um, anyway, just know that this isn't mine, but someone, I believe his name was Harold Schneider, maybe, came up with these tests to test our hearts for idolatry. And he, I think he had five or six. I'm just going to take three of them here. Uh, but the first one is time and attention. It's to say, okay, if we're going to root out idolatry in our heart, we have to be able to identify it. And so that's what these tests are aimed at. And the first one is the test of time and attention. And that's simply to say, okay, as you look at your life, where is the majority of my time spent? Where is the majority of my attention and focus focused on? And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a correlation between how much time you spend on something and an idol. But it could be. As we know, the things that we worship, we spend time on. We give them our attention. And so, as that, just to kind of get the ball rolling, think, okay, God, where do I spend my time? Where do I focus my attention? Is there any correlation that I could possibly worship with? The second test is much deeper and harder and almost always reveals an idol. And that's the test of letting go, of to ask yourself, okay, what is there in my life that I would say I simply cannot let go of this thing, this person, this relationship, whatever it may be, this attitude? And what did God call Abraham to do? He said, I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. That there was no... God knew exactly what Abraham loved most. And if, if there is something in our life that we are not willing to let go of, it almost always represents an idol, something that we are holding on to because we love it and we worship it. But then compare that to what Abraham did in response to the Lord. He did. He got up early. He went to exact location that God told him to. And he offered Isaac in his heart, even though his hand never touched him. Because in his heart, he believed, God, if I'm going to do what you say, and I'm going to trust that you make this right. Either you're going to stop it, or you're going to bring him back to life. There was nothing in Abraham's life that he loved more than God. And as hard as that is, and it's... it's just think that test of letting go, it reveals, okay, God, is there anything in my life that I love more than you? And then the third one is the test of behavior. We know that uh, idolatry it corrupts our praise. It corrupts the way we worship. It corrupts our loyalty. It corrupts what we are um, 
what we pledge our allegiance to, and it also corrupts our pursuits. The, the test of behavior is, okay, what is it in my life that changes how I behave? Because I think we, we interact with and we come across lots of things on a daily basis, but very few things actually change how we act, change how we think, change how we behave. And so when we come across something that actually changes our pursuit, it changes our behavior, there's a good chance that that is something that we worship because we believe in what it promises. And I pray that in my life, in your life, that the only thing that would affect and change our behavior is that the Word of God, that, that we're going to say, God, I'm going to do as best I can what you have called me to do. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what my family says. The only thing that I'm going to allow to affect my behavior is your word. I think the problem with idolatry is that it is so very practical. We, it's easy to see something and give our attention and our focus to it because we can see it. But I just encourage you, the next time that you're tempted to worship something, anything other than the Lord, just pause for a moment and say, God, I'm going to give you praise for this thing. Instead of idolizing this, this attitude, this object, this resource, God, I'm going to praise you because you are the reason that I have it. You've given it to me. That's the problem with idolatry. We take what God has given us and we make it a deity. But when we stop and say, God, I'm going to give you praise for this. It puts that focus back on him as the creator, as the protector, as the preserver, and as the joy of our life. So we see in verse 6 that really he's talking about those who've turned away from following the Lord because they don't seek and they don't inquire of the Lord. And to turn that into a positive, the way we find idolatry is to seek and to inquire deeper and deeper. That in every practical aspect of your life, God has given you work and hobbies and pursuits and pleasures and joys for our enjoyment, but also as an element of praise to give him the thanks for the good things that he has given us. To seek the Lord practically, to seek the Lord persistently, to not give up. Don't let your allegiance slide towards anything else. Seek and inquire of the Lord and him. Alone, let me pray.